Well, just send three flights in 10 hours, and we are on the northernmost archipelago on the planet Earth. We are on Spitsbergen, guys. On the northernmost inhabited one, to be clear, there is also Franz Josef Land, but nobody lives there all year round, and here they do. Right next to the luggage carousel, the owner of the land welcomes the newcomers, the polar bear, because there are even more bears than people here on Spitsbergen. Well, it's time to look around. Where are we this time? Longyearbyen, the capital of Spitsbergen, cannot even be called a small town in the mainland standards. The population of this largest northern settlement is only 2,144 people. They don't even lock up the bicycles left on the street. They are up for grabs, but they just do not steal because everyone knows each other. They don't lock the doors, cars, and the houses themselves stand on piles because of permafrost. Ten months a year, the land is covered with snow, so snowmobiles are just right for this weather. There are also many sled dogs here, but cats are forbidden here because of rabies. But in general, you do not feel cut off. There is a souvenir shop here with a polar bear at the entrance, of course, two groceries, a couple of restaurants, and a couple of hotels. In total, there are several dozens of squat houses along one central street, which is called the street. And this is the central square of Longyearbyen, and of course there is a monument to the miner here. Well, simply because it was these people who founded this city exactly 110 years ago. The only thing left of miners here is the habit of taking off shoes when entering the room. At that time, Longyearbyen looked like this. In 1906, this guy, American John Longyear, started coal mining operations here, and later he sold the mine to the Norwegians. But after a century, Arctic mineral extraction has exhausted itself. It was simply unprofitable. Today, there is only one mine near Longyearbyen, mostly serving the needs of the town itself. But despite the modern civilization of this place, the very place lays its own, sometimes very strange, laws. In Longyearbyen, dying is prohibited by law. Even the pensioners are packed off to the mainland. All this is due to the fact that here any burial inevitably attracts polar bears. And this is the only cemetery. Here lie the 35 best town representatives who were honored enough to stay here on Spitsbergen. But they were all cremated in order to not attract polar bears. The reason is permafrost. In these polar regions, it extends 600 meters deep and can preserve anything that gets into it in its original form. So why not take advantage? In the depths of, not the Siberian mines, but the permafrost of Spitsbergen, right under my feet, lies a real treasure. This is a global seed vault, a sort of Noah's Ark for all plants of the planet Earth in case of a global catastrophe. From this entrance, the tunnel goes 120 meters deep into the mountain, so that in its cold depths, four and a half million future sprouts of life could be eternally stored. Three times a year, replenishment comes to Spitsbergen from around the world. Then this car runs up the mountain, and only then the doors of the depository open. Boxes with seeds are transported down a 100-meter tunnel through five different doors, which are unlocked with five different keys. There are also CCTV cameras and motion sensors, and these walls can withstand any earthquake. In the storage chamber, the seeds are cataloged, and then they finally take their place on the shelf. Unlike other seed banks, this storage is international and, by the way, the most trouble-proof. There is an additional generator here, but it only lowers the temperature a few degrees, but the natural frost carries out the bulk of the work to preserve the seeds. At minus 18, the grains can be stored for at least several centuries. Such a funny paradox story. Permafrost would usually seem to harm plants, but here on Spitsbergen, on the contrary, it helps. That's a kind of eternal refrigerator. 
But for the Arctic flora itself, the local severe climate is, of course, a harsh challenge. Even in the polar summer, the temperature on Spitsbergen is rarely more than 5 degrees Celsius. Therefore, the plant kingdom is not very diverse. Not a desert, of course, but a low tundra. And yet, the climate of the Arctic Gate, that's what they call Spitsbergen, is actually quite mild, thanks to the Gulf Stream. This warm Atlantic current reaches the Barents and Kara Seas and washes the archipelago from two sides. Therefore, even in winter, the temperature is rarely less than negative 20 degrees Celsius, although the distance to North Pole is less than from Moscow to Yufa. And on June 8, 2016, it is all 10 degrees Celsius. Because this is uh, one of the warmest days this year, so... We're really? lucky, yeah. Oh, we're lucky. The position of Carl Jansen does not have an accurate translation in Russian aviation. In fact, he is everyone in the northernmost civil airport, from ensuring flights to passenger check-in. And he has seen a lot in his five years here. It's very easy to, to tell about uh, last winter. We had a tragic uh, avalanche in downtown Mogenville. And we had an extremely hard weather, extremely hard storm. And during that night, we had a very sad uh, avalanche. Uh, and eight people were uh, hidden by, by snow, mm -hmm. were covered, uh, and uh, two uh, died, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Spitsbergen is where cold polar air and mild wet sea air meet, creating strong winds in winter and low visibility in summer. The archipelago was even called an island of fogs. And yet the northernmost airport works rain and shine. Uh, what we do, we heat up sand and moisturing it, and then we put it on, on the very cold surface. Mm -hmm. And when the, the sand hits the ground, hits the ice, mm -hmm. it will stick very hard, and you will have a, a sandpaper uh, surface which is very good for the braking action for aer uh, airplanes. But for flights to Long Yerbien, the airlines assign only the best pilots. This is not subject to aviation regulations, but not everyone can land here. When you um, have the in-flight from, uh, from the west, mm -hmm. you see you have the in-flight period from uh, over the sea. That makes it easier. When you come in from east, from that direction, you have more what you are saying. Uh, that makes it a little bit more difficult, and uh, it makes uh, this airport at Svalbard one of the most difficult airports uh, for landing. On 29 August 1996, Russian TU-154 crashed into Abra Fajale Mountain at an altitude of 907 meters and just 14 kilometers from the airport. There were 141 people on board. 130 of them were passengers, Russian miners flying to the Russian mining community with their families. No one survived. They turned left too late, actually and uh, they hit very uh, close to the top, so they were just, were just meters from make it. Mm -hmm. So a very, very tragic uh, incident. This is that very mountain. Its peak is hidden in the mist today too. The commission found the crew guilty, but after that disaster, Norway recommended air traffic controllers to give the pilots information about the bay temperature. If it changes rapidly, the geomagnetic field can change too and hence the readout of the runway radio beacon that determines the accuracy of the landing approach. Svalbard, or Spitsbergen, became a full part of Norway after the Svalbard Treaty of 1920. But at the same time, the parties to the treaty, including Russia, were given the right of presence on the archipelago for exploitation of natural resources. Simply put, Russia can be here as long as it produces coal. And Barentsburg, and here it is, is, naturally, a mining community. This mine was the last of the three bought by the Soviet Union, and it is the last working one now. There are coal deposits in the depths of Olav Mountain, and Barentsburg is on its top. The port is exactly 264 steps away from the city. Actually, Russia has only 251 square kilometers of the archipelago. This area is 10 times smaller than Moscow, for example. And most of these square kilometers are right here. So it can be said that Barentsburg is the capital of Russia on Svalbard. 
It doesn't look like the capital, of course, but it looks quite like Russia. And this is the central street of Barentsburg. Hello. And one, oops, feels like home at once. Oh, those roads. Here's the bypass. This settlement is the second largest after Longyearbyen. Its population is about 400 people, and most of them are miners and their families. Here, for example, Alia, Dasha, and Nastya, children of miners, are looking for rare polar flowers. Hi, and why aren't you at school? We have holidays now. Holidays? Yes, the summer holidays. Winter coats made me forget about the summer, but there is a superstition. When this inscription shows up out of snow, it's summertime. The polar night retreats. During the polar night, you wake up every morning and you don't understand whether it is morning or night. Boys always are late for school and we go to school by bus. And why? Why do you go by bus? Because it's dark and they say a bear might attack you. Children are like the children of the world. They walk and miss the shorts and skirts, and they ask unchildish questions. What is communism? Well, it says here we are for, we are for communism. What is it? What are we for? But there is coal here. Coal is the greatest wealth of the ice archipelago. When Russia began developing these deposits in 1932, the only other coal mine Russia had was the Donbass. But now it is already clear that this Arctic coal is no bargain. Our mine is dangerous beyond categories. Methane hazard, coal mine bumps, mountain bumps. What does it mean? Well, this is a sign of underground pressure. Denis Sherba is a miner from Donbass, but for several years he has been responsible for coal mining on Spitsbergen. And why is it so high here? Well, because there are mountains here, hills. Local rocks are very sturdy, and although extraction is performed at relatively shallow depths, there is the entrance, so close, but... No, not allowed. We are not allowed into the mine categorically. Just since 1989, 47 miners died in these faces. Here it is, Denis, the result of your work. How many tons are there now? Approximately 60,000 tons. Semi-annual production. 120,000 tons. The amount seems huge, but in fact, it is three ten-thousandth percent of Russia's annual production, and the fourth part of it remains here, in Barrettsburg, for local needs. Five times a year, the ship comes to take the rest. And here is an interesting feature. Because of the specific location of the mine, they move not the belt of the loader, but the ship itself. But this cargo is not very valuable. There is 4% of sulfur in polar coal, so it is not very good for carbonization, that is, as a fuel. And there isn't much left of it, according to calculations, until 2030. It depends on how we get it. You can get not 120,000, you can get less. Do not forget, Russia can be on this land while the miners are under this land. Hello. Hello. Can I shake your hand? It's dirty. A working hand. Here they are, real miners. And this, of course, is a Herculean task. I'm very dirty. That's OK. Of course, in half an hour, I'll be fresh as a daisy. Of course, in half an hour, I'll be fresh like a daisy. By the way, the shower in Barentsburg was a luxury until 1975. 